module five of the ACI multi-site training, we're gonna look into the implementation detail of the control and data plane for the multi-site architecture. As a first step, we're gonna cover an important concept, which is the one of namespace normalization and shadow objects. We'll then look into the different per bridge domain behaviors that can be enabled in multi-site to allow layer two and layer three connectivity between the sites. We'll discuss in detail the implementation for control plane and data plane. We'll talk about underlay control plane, overlay control plane, and overlay uh, data plane communication. And in the last step of this module, we are going to cover two important functionalities that allow to simplify the application of policies when you want to establish inter site connectivity, preferred group, and VZN. Let's start talking about the concept of namespace normalization and shadow object. Before moving into that, one important point I want to clarify is the fact that the ACI multi-site architecture in terms of hardware is supported with any generation of leaf switches. So first generation, EX, FX, and newer. But there is an other dependency for what concerns the spines. The spines in an ACI fabric that needs to be part of a multi-site domain need to be second generation. So EX, line card, or newer, if you deploy a modular spine, or the non-modular models that you see here on the slide, the 9332C, 9364C, or 9316D. It is not possible to use first generation spines to establish inter-site connectivity. You can still use the first generation spines but only for intra-site uh, connectivity. Only the second generation spines can be actually connected to the inter-site network. The reason why we need the second generation of hardware in the spine is because of, we'll see, an ingress replication function which is used when we send layer two flooded traffic across sites, but more, but more importantly, to support the namespace normalization functionality. What, is, what do we mean with namespace normalization? Okay, in order to understand, we need to remember that for every communication between endpoints located in different sites, we establish a VXLAN tunnel that goes site to site. The use of the XLAN tunnel allows to carry metadata information with the packets. And this metadata information is network specific information. So VNID values that identify the VRF or the bridge domain for the source and point, depending if it is layer two traffic or layer two traffic. And the class ID, which identifies the specific endpoint group that the source and point belongs to normally. And extending or carrying this VNID and class ID information with every packet that is sent across sites is what allows a consistent end-to-end -end connectivity, layer two or layer three, and policy. However, the important point to understand is that these VNIDs and class ID values are always assigned locally by the EPIC domain for the fabrics that is connected to the multi-site domain. That means that different EPIC domains may assign different VNIDs and class ID values even to objects that are supposed to represent the same uh, logical entity. In order to understand, let's look at this example where we have two sites and an endpoint part of an EPG in site 1 that wants to communicate with an endpoint part of an EPG in site 2. In order to establish that connectivity, we need to go on the multi-site orchestrator and create a contract between my web EPG that lives in site one and my app EPG that lives in site two. The moment I create that contract and the multi-site orchestrator basically then allows you to push that configuration to each epic domain so that the configuration can be locally rendered. When we render, so basically when we configure the specific policy in each EPIC site, this leads to the creation of what we call shadow object, shadow EPGs, shadow bridge domains. Why are these shadow objects created? Because inside each site, we need to recreate the same relationship between the EPGs that we have defined on the multi-site orchestrator. So since we want the web EPG to communicate with the app EPG with a given contract, in site one, we don't have any instantiation of the app EPG because we said the app EPG in this example lives only in site two. So the epic in site one basically creates a shadow 
copy of the app EPG so that it can assign to it specific values like VNIDs values for the VRF and the bridge domain that that app EPG belongs to and for the class ID. The same thing happens for the green web EPG in site 2. Why do we need this shadow object? Imagine the endpoint 1 sends traffic to the endpoint 2 in site 2. When the packet is VXLAN encapsulated in the source site, in site 1, metadata information is assigned in the VXLAN header concerning VNID and class ID that identifies the endpoint 1 part of the web EPG. And specifically, as you see here, the VNID of the VRF, in this case, because we assume it's layer 3 communication between sites, and the class ID of the green EPG is a, a configured in the header of the VXLAN packet. That values are basically sent across sites that VXLAN encapsulated traffic goes across the inter-site network. When we get to site 2, we need to ensure that before the packet is injected inside site 2, these values, the VNID for the VRF, the class ID for the EPG, that have meaning in site 1, but may have completely different meaning in site 2, they need to be change, right? So I need to change this value to value that really means the same thing, right? The VRF that EP1 belongs to and the EPG that EP1 belongs to in site 2 as well. And in order to have values that have the meaning, the shadow web EPG and shadow web BD has been created so that the epic domain 2 could assign VRF VNID value, BD VNID value and class ID values to that object. And if you compare, you see that these values inside 2 are different from the one inside 1. So what we need is that before traffic is injected inside 2, the spines actually perform a translation between the values assigned to the object green web EPG inside 1 and the one assigned inside 2. That translation is performed on the spine of the receiving site based on information that is configured in some specific spine table called translation tables. And it is the multi-site orchestrator that instruct the different epic domain to properly configure these translation tables so that communication left to right and right to left could be established between locally defined EPGs. So the important point to take from this is that we need the translation to happen line rate that's why we need specific hardware, and that justifies the need for second generation hardware in the spines. The other point is we need policies to be configured on MSO every time I want inter-site connectivity to happen. Why? Because then the MSO communicates to the EPIC the right information to properly configure the translation tables. That essentially means that this inter-site VXLAN enabled communication can only work if I stretch and point group EPGs or bridge domains, because by stretching them, the MSO will communicate to the EPIC the need to create these translation entries. Or if I create a contract, like in my example, between an EPG that only exists in site one and an EPG that only exists in site two. So it is mandatory every time we want to establish that VXLAN enabled communication between sites to create this policy on MSO. As I said in the last part of this module, we will see that the user preferred group or VZNE are two alternative ways to ensure that these translation tables are properly populated in order to allow east-west connectivity. Let's now look into how to establish layer 2 and layer 3 flexible connectivity between the sites based on third bridge domain behavior that is configured on the multi-site orchestrator. As Joe showed you in the lab part of module 4 of this training, it's possible basically to provision policies to the different sites based on the creation of schemas and templates. And the object uh, defined in a template can be pushed to a specific site or to multiple sites based on the association that you do between a template and the sites. Here, in the first use case that we're going to show is the one where I want to establish intra-VRF layer 3 communication across sites. This means I need to basically extend the tenant presence across both sites, site 1 and site 2. I need to create a stretch VRF, VRF1 in this example that exists in both sites. And for what concerns the EPGs and the bridge domain, I create a local EPG and bridge domain for web inside one and a local EPG and bridge domain for app inside two. 
These are basically object EPG and BDs that are assigned to two different templates, one assigned or mapped to site one, one to site two. Once I establish the contract between the EPG, web and app, this will lead to the creation of the shadow object, as we discussed in the previous slide, and will allow to start and points part of this EPG to start communicating. And this will be layer three communication across sites because these different EPGs in this example are mapped to bridge domain that have a different subnet. It could be that I could actually define two EPGs part of the same bridge domain if I wanted and even create an intra-subnet inter-site communication, but in this use case is basically layer three uh, communication between sites. The second use case is the one where I still want to create a layer three connectivity between the sites, so between different subnets, but I also want to stretch the EPGs. So the web EPG is stretched between site one and site two, the app EPG is stretched between the same site one and two. In order to achieve this configuration, I need to create my bridge domain still as known layer two stretch object, because I want to have a different subnet assigned to that uh, web BD and app BD in the different sites, but since the same web BD and app BD needs to exist in both sites, I need to define this bridge domain in a template which is mapped to both sites. So the key for this configuration is the BDs like the APG is defined in a common template, but by not enabling L to stretch for the BD, that allows me to configure the subnet at the site level. And basically the same web BD will use a subnet one different from the subnet that I assigned to web BD in site two. So now this basically allows to establish intra VRF layer three connectivity, both for intra EPG communication, that obviously does not require by default a contract, and for inter EPG communication, once I create my contract C1. There is also no need to create shadow object in this example, because all these objects are pushed and deployed to both sides at the same time. A third use case is the one where I want to establish layer three connectivity between sites, but between VRFs, not in the context of the same VRF. This is a use case that usually is also called share services. In this case, I need to basically stretch my tenant because the tenant exists across sites, but the VRF, bridge domain and EPG are locally defined in each site. So from a bridge domain configuration perspective, the L2 stretch needs to be off because the VRF, the BD and the EPG object are defined in a template, which is only local to the sites. By doing this and by establishing then a contract between the web EPG and app EPG, Two purposes are served. First, we create the shadow object, as we said. Second, we also create a route leaking functionality that allows the subnet of VRF1 to be leaked into VRF2 and vice versa. In reality, the contract allows only the route leaking in one direction to leak the routes in the other direction. We also need to configure the subnet under the provider EPG, which has always been needed also at the single epic domain level uh, in SEI. So, Again, this allows to establish layer three connectivity across VRF, across sites, and leads to the creation of shadow objects. The last use case based on the bridge domain configuration that I want to cover is actually a double use case where I want to stretch the, the EPGs across sites, like we show a couple of uh, slides back, but I also want to stretch the bridge domain and its subnet. Okay, so this is really a scenario where it's a more typical way of extending a bridge domain and a subnet between sites. However, multi-site allows you to do this subnet extension, bridge domain extension into different ways. One way is where I basically set the layer to stretch flag for the bridge domain, but not the inter-site BAM traffic allow flag, as you see for the BD web example. What that means is that I allow the same subnet to exist across sites, I allow mobility of endpoints that could be call migration due to a disaster recovery or could be also live migration based on uh, vSphere vMotion, for example, but I do not extend the bad part of layer two extension, which is the flooding of traffic. This is critical because I want to assure that if I have a problem in the bridge domain web, a broadcast storm happening in site one in bridge domain web, that broadcast storm does not propagate to site two. And it's a unique functionality that multi-site allows you to do, extending a bridge domain without extending the flooding. Okay, it's the safest possible way to extend a bridge domain. 
In some cases, I may actually need though to extend also the flooding. And this is the configuration of the database bridge domain here, which has both flag L2 stretch and intersite bump traffic allowed set. And I may need to do this when I need to establish true layer two adjacency between endpoints that are located in different sites. For example, I have an application clustering, database clustering that requires the member of the cluster to communicate a layer two with a pure layer two protocol. In that case, I need the flooding and I need the multicast layer two broadcast traffic to also be sent across sites. As we already mentioned previously, when I extend the bump forwarding across sites, we use ingress replication on the spines to replicate these bump frames to all the sites where the bridge domain is extended. And we will look into that more in detail. But I want to clarify that it's possible to extend layer two across sites with multi-site based on the configuration of the bridge domain. And it's possible to do it in a safer way, which is the recommended one, or if really needed, and hopefully that's more an exception than the rule, by turning the flooding on as well. Let's now look into more detail of the underlay and overlay control plane deployment. So for what concerns the underlay, the goal of the multi-site architecture is to be able to build a hierarchical underlay design where I control very tightly the prefixes that I need to exchange from an underlay routing table perspective between the sites. I need to exchange across sites are a handful of IP addresses, specifically an IP address that each spine in a site that is part of a multi-site domain will be assigned from MSO, which we call the EVPN router ID. These are basically loopbacks, if you want, unique loopbacks that are defined on each spine uh, of that site that are used to establish the EVPN overlay control plane with the spines of the remote sites. So in this case, I have a site with four spines. I will need to assign four slash 32 prefixes, one per spine on the multi-site orchestrator. For what concerns the data plane communication, then each site has always assigned two addresses that basically are assigned to all the spines that are part of the fabric. One is a, a overlay Unica step address, which is used to send and receive uh, layer two and layer three Unica traffic, VXLAN encapsulated. And the second one is called the overlay multicast step address, which is always used to receive layer two BAM traffic, which is originated from a remote site. So these EVPN router IDs, overlay Unica step and overlay multicast step, are really the only addresses that need to be exchanged across sites. So I don't need to exchange information about the original tap pool, like in this example, tap pool one and tap pool two, they were assigned to the fabric during the fabric bring up process. Okay, so this is very critical because this tap pool that have been assigned during the bring up process of a fabric could actually also be overlapping across sites or could be non routable across the interset network. So I don't want to rely on or assume that actually uh, they are not overlapping and they are routable. OSPF is established between the spines and the interside network devices, and OSPF allows to exchange information about these EVPN router IDs, overlay Unica step, and overlay multicast step addresses. In reality, even the original tap pool are advertised to the interside network using the OSPF peering, and we will understand why when we talk in a future module of the multi-site training about the uh, coexistence of multi-site and multipod. That means that the recommendation is to filter out on the first interside network device where the spines are connected the advertisement of these internal tap pools because they, we don't need this internal tap pool to be exchanged across sites, so we should filter them before advertise them in the ISN backbone. The result of that is that if I look inside the Intersight Network routing table, I should be able to see only the specific VPN router IDs for all the spines of all the fabrics, part of the multi-site domain, and the overlay Unica step address and overlay multicast step address that are assigned to the spines of each site. These prefixes are exchanged across sites when the spine receives them from the Intersight Network automatic and mutual redistribution will happen into the ISIS process running in each site, which will allow essentially the leaf 
in uh, each site to have knowledge how to reach the IP addresses that are relative to a remote site. Right? In this example, you see here that the, a leaf in site one knows how to get to the VPN router ID, the overlay unique step and the overlay multi step of the spines in site two. So this basically gives me tight control, makes my routing table small in the internet network and ensures that even if I have a series of convergence events uh, for what concern the underlay network of site one, all these events are shielded from site two. So that makes a more resilient end-to-end -end underlay routing protocol design. The hierarchical design is also done on the overlay because in the overlay we have actually EVPN, which is a control plane which is established between uh, the spines in different sites. And I want to have also a tight control on the type of information that I exchange across sites. In order to understand that, let's look at an example. I have an endpoint one which is connected in site one. <clears throat> this is typical ACI. What happens, the leaf will discover the endpoint one, will send a coop control plane information to the local spine to add the information about EP1 in the local kube database. The same thing happens for an endpoint EP2, which is connected to site two. So EP2 will end up in the kube database of the spine in site two. At this point, I am not exchanging this information about EP1 uh, or EP2 across sites. Why? Because I don't need to. So. I don't need to because I don't have any policy defined yet that says I want the EPG of EP1 to communicate to the EPG of EP2. The moment I define such a policy on the multi-site orchestrator and I push that policy to the EPIC domain, this is the moment where the EVPN control plane will kick in and will allow to exchange reachability information now for the endpoints. And so, as a result, the spines in Site1 will learn that EP2 is reachable, is MAC address, is IP addresses, uh, are reachable via the overlay Unica step address identifying site two, and vice versa will happen for the spine in site two for what concern the information of endpoint one. But the important point to clarify is that this exchange of reachability information is only triggered by the creation of a policy that says I need to allow communication between these EPGs across sites. And this is important because I want to ensure that if I have EPGs that only communicate locally inside a site and maybe with the external layer three domain, but they don't need any inter-site communication, we keep the endpoints for this EPG locally to the site only, right? Because I don't want to affect the overall scalability of endpoints that I can have in a multi-site domain, right? The, the overall scalability of endpoints can linearly grow with the number of sites that I add, because only the common endpoints are the one that basically will exist end-to-end. Uh, -end. Now, based on this exchange of overlay information between sites, we can actually establish data plane communication. So how does it work? How is, how is a packet going from one site to another in multi-site? Well, we're real quick, Let's imagine that I have an endpoint EP1, part of a subnet, 101010, which wants to communicate with an, with an endpoint EP2, part of a subnet 202020. I, as always, go on my MSO in this example, I apply my contract, my policy between the two EPGs, uh, render the policy on each epic domain. Now, when the endpoint one sends the first packet, uh, which is destined to 202020, the leaf will do a lookup, imagining and assuming that this is the first time that that leaf needs to communicate with EP2, the leaf will not have any EP2 specific information. So we will have an entry that will say when we don't know what to do with the packet, let's send it to the spine, because if the EP2 exists in the multi-site domain, the spine will know about it. So the packet is basically encapsulated to the proxy A address, which identifies all the local spines. One of the spines will receive the packet, will perform a lookup in the coop database, and it will find the information of EP2, because as we say in the previous slide, that EP2 information is received through the EVPN control plane. And so what the spine will do, will encapsulate the packet to the overlay Unica step B address identifying site two, which is where the endpoint EP2 is connected. But the spine in site one does also another thing, which is changing the, the IP address of the source to match overlay Unica step A. This is because we want that every packet in the inter-site network is always seen as a single IP flow between the overlay Unica step A address identifying site one and the overlay Unica step B address identifying site B.
And so this basically simplifies also the troubleshooting or communication between sites because I need to track a single flow. The packet will arrive to the site two. One of the spine will receive the packet because they all have a loopback overlay unicast step B that allows them to receive the packet. They will perform a local lookup. They will see, oh, okay, this endpoint TP2 is connected behind the local leaf. So the spine will change the destination IP address in the VXLAN header to be the one of the leaf four. The packet will get to the leaf. Once it gets to the leaf, two things are going to happen. Point number one, I'm going to learn on the data plane, from the data plane traffic, the location information for EP1. So I will know that EP1 is associated to the overlay unique step A address, which identifies site one, which is also a reason why the spine in site one had to change the source IP address and put overlay unique step A. Okay, so that I could associate EP1 to that site. Point number two, I can now apply a policy because I could not apply the policy in site one because I had no information about uh, which EPG EP2 was belonging to. But now I know everything because the EPG of EP1 is carried with the packet. Uh, the EPG of EP2 is known because EP2 is locally connected to the leaf in site two. So I can apply the policy. And if the policy is to forward the packet, the packet will go to uh, EP2. On the return flow, when EP2 sends the packet back, well, now when the leaf performs the lookup, the leaf knows everything. It knows where EP1 is located. It knows the uh, EPG EP1 belongs to. So it can apply policy. And if the policy is to allow the packet to go, the packet will be encapsulated directly to the overlay Unica step A address, identifying site one. The packet will cross the ISN. When crossing the local spine in site two, the spine will again change the source address of the VXLAN header to be overlay Unica step B. The packet will get to the spine in site one. The spine will do the lookup. We'll know that the packet needs to be sent to the uh, local leaf. When the packet gets to the local leaf, the leaf will learn the location information for EP2. We'll not have to apply policy because the policy has already been applied in site two in this example. And there is a bit in the VXLAN header that informs the receiving leaf in site one that there is no need to apply the policy. And so the packet will go and be delivered to EP1. From this moment on, since we populated the leaf forwarding table with specific endpoint information based on data plane communication, all the communication between the two sites will be established by creating tunnels between the leaf and the remote uh, spine overlay unique step addresses. Okay, and so in the two directions, the tunnels will be built like that. Okay, and the policy for normal EPG to EPG communication will always be applied in ingress. Okay, assuming there is intra VRF. If it's inter VRF or if I do PBR, a service graph, things may change, and we will cover that when we talk about service node insertion with multi site. Last part I want to cover about data plane is what happens if I need to send a layer two flooded traffic across site. So the example I made before where I extend a bridge domain and then also turn on the BAM forwarding flag. In that case, when EP1 generates a BAM frame, the packet is first locally distributed inside the site uh, using multicast. So it's basically encapsulated in a VXLAN packet with the destination, the multicast address, which identifies the specific bridge domain EP1 belongs to. One of the pine will then be elected as designated forwarded for that bridge domain, which means will be responsible to create copies for every BAM packet locally originated in set one and send it to all the remote sites where that bridge domain has been extended. In this example, only site two. So Spine 3 is a designated forwarder, create a copy of each BAM packet and send it to the overlay multicast tap address which identifies site 2. Packet gets to one of the spines in site 2. The spine will basically perform the local translation because the multicast group associated to the bridge domain different in site 1 and in site 2, obviously, and then will basically forward the traffic inside site 2 map to that specific multicast group. So the XLAN encapsulated with the destination being uh, the specific multicast group for that bridge domain inside two. And the packet will reach all the leaf where the bridge domain is deployed and then will deliver to the endpoint two. For the return, the exact same mechanism will happen. 
Let's now look into a couple of functionalities that simplify the policy application and the establishment of inter-site connectivity uh, with multi-site. One is preferred group, the second one is busy any. Preferred group is a functionality that has been exposed and supported with multi-site and on the multi-site orchestrator from the release 202. It's basically a configuration that allows to specify a subset of EPGs, part of a VRF, and ensure that these EPGs can communicate with each other freely without requiring any contract. So it's basically the equivalent of a configuration that we have been supporting on EPIC for a long time, which is called VRF Unenforced, where I want to allow the use of ACI just for connectivity and not to apply security policies. Now, as shown in this slide, the free communication is only between the EPGs that are part of the preferred group for the VRF. Every time these EPGs want to communicate instead with an EPG that is outside the preferred group, then a regular contract, uh, as always, needs to be applied and configured. The configuration of preferred group from the multi-site orchestrator obviously needs to lead to the creation of shadow object in scenarios where EPGs are only locally defined in a site because it needs to allow inter-site connectivity with EPGs that are defined in a remote site. And when deploying this functionality, it's important also to keep in mind some scalability consideration. Before release 224, we only supported 250 EPGs, part of preferred group across the VRF in a multi-site domain. From release 224, we increase this value to 500. This value will go up in time, so just keep checking the scalability guide and the release note to be sure that the release of MSO that you want to run, you will have a proper coverage in terms of scale of the EPG. And a typical use case where this is useful is for legacy to uh, network to ACI migration scenarios where I didn't use any policies between my VLANs in the legacy network and initially I want to maintain the same behavior also on the ACI side, even multi-site. As I mentioned, when I go on the multi-site orchestrator and I push my preferred group configuration specifying uh, which EPG need to be part of the preferred group, and as you see here, the external EPG associated to the L3 out can also be part of the preferred group. This will end up creating and populating the translation table in the pines of the different sites, part of the multi-site domain, so that east-to-west inter-site connectivity between endpoints can be established and also connectivity with the external world, right through the external EPG. One important note, when adding the external EPG to the preferred group, it's important to clarify that the subnet 000 slash 0 or that prefix cannot be used for classifying incoming traffic as part of that external EPG, but we need basically to split that default prefix, uh, catch-all, into two specific subnet, 000 slash 1 and 128.000 slash 1. Otherwise, the preferred group functionality for the external EPG would not be effective. And also another important point from a configuration perspective, when an external EPG must be part of the preferred group, it needs to be configured as a stretch object, right? The same external EPG needs to be pushed to the different sites. The second functionality that allows to simplify policy enforcement is called VZNE. So first of all, what is VZNE? VZNE is a logical object they represent all the EPGs in a VRF, all of them, okay? We prefer group, I specify which specific EPGs were part of the preferred group. VZN identifies all the EPGs in a VRF. Now, what are some use cases that VZN allows to configure and to deploy? The first use case is if I want to establish a many-to-one communication, which we usually call shared services. So I want all the EPGs part of my VRF to be able to communicate with a specific shared EPG that could be part of the same VRF or of a different VRF. Instead of applying individual contract between EPG1 and the shared EPG, EPG2 and the shared EPG, and so far and so on, I can create a single contract and say VZNE consumes this contract C1, which is provided by the shared EPG. And as a result of this policy definition, all the EPGs part of VRF1 will be able to consume that service offered by the shared EPG. So it's a much easier way to establish this many-to-one connectivity instead of creating all these different one-to-one -one contracts. Now, obviously, when we bring 
this into a multi-site deployment. And by the way, we have been supporting VZNE on the multi-site orchestrator from release two to four. That means that I create my configuration on the multi-site orchestrator. For this use case, as I said, VZNE consuming a contract which is provided by a, a shared EPG. And by doing that, what will happen is the translation table will be properly populated on the spine so that I will have the capability of local access to a shared service from an EPG inside two. And this obviously does not require the translation tables, but it requires the uh, creation of the contract. But the translation table will be needed when I have an endpoint in an EPG1 inside one that needs to access a shared EPG inside two. And obviously the same many to one could also be applied if the shared resource is actually an external resource. In that case, we will use the external EPG as a way to get to the external resource. The second use case for VZNE is the one where I want to establish free communication in a VRF. So here really becomes similar to Prefer Group. Instead of configuring my EPG as part of the Prefer Group, I could create a contract C1 with a filter that says permit any traffic and then having VZNE consuming and providing that contract. By doing that, essentially the VRF will start behaving the same way as VRF unenforced, so no policy will be applied between the EPGs part of the same VRF and they will be able to communicate freely with each other. And a contract will only be needed to communicate with something which is outside the VRF. One important point to clarify, which applies to both use cases of VZNE, the contract can only be enforced at the fabric level. We cannot associate a service graph, for example, with policy-based redirection to redirect the traffic to a specific firewall node. This will come in a future release, but for now, uh, that contract can only apply policy at the fabric level. And as we said before, by creating the VZNE configuration for this any-to-any -any, uh, connectivity requirement use case, translation table will be configured on the spine to allow east-west and north-south communication between endpoints part of the EPGs of the VRF, no matter if the endpoints are in the same site or scattered across sites. This ends this long module five of the CI multi-site training. We cover lots of uh, important information. That's why this module was more beefy than the other one. Now I leave you to the wise hands of Joe that will show you some of this concept uh, in action in his lab. Thanks for watching. Thank you.